that you could have driven through a conceivably sustainable solution in the early 90s. After the first Palestinian Intifada, Israel's understanding of the possibility of a pain-free, cheap occupation evaporated. Uh, serious strategic thinkers like Rabin understood. Rabin understood this. You could not go on as they had gone before. That's why he made the changes he made. That's why he negotiated with the PLO. Now, the tragedy is that opportunity was not taken. The, the door was open. If somebody had kicked it, kicked it down, you might have been able to have a solution. So uh, I'll answer your question. Um, so there may have been a chance of a two-state solution in the early 90s. Um, there is a problem with the one-state solution. There are several problems with the one-state solution. One problem is that there is an enormous amount of international legitimacy that attaches to the continued existence of the state of Israel. In 1947, the General Assembly voted for a Jewish state. It also voted for an Arab state, but the great powers didn't care about that. If the United States and the Soviet Union had cared about an Arab state, they wouldn't have prevented Israel, Jordan, and Britain from strangling the Arab state at birth. Nobody even heard about it. Never saw the light of day. Nobody cared. That wasn't what they were voting for. They were voting for a Jewish state. And there is an international consensus that there should be such a state. There has since developed a consensus that there should be a Palestinian state. And that overwhelming majority of the world's countries believe in that. So to get a one-state solution, you have to go back and re rewrite 66 years of international resolutions and of the view of almost every important country in the world that that should be. That's the first problem. The second problem is that most Israelis, and I would guess probably most Palestinians, really would prefer not to live together. Okay? These are two peoples that for a variety of reasons have developed their own independent national sense of identity. And in the case of the Palestinians, that has never been realized in the form of a state. So a one-state solution would argue that the Palestinians should just leap over the state of self-determination and statehood and go into some indeterminate, undefinable uh, 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 arrangement with a very powerful existing Israeli state. Now, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying those are obstacles to it. Uh, I would argue that a two-state solution uh, is even less likely in many ways because of dynamics that I do not see being reversed. They could be reversed, but I don't see them being reversed. Could you reverse this dynamic of settlement? If you could, you might be able to uh, uh, achieve a two-state solution. But that would require undoing 40-some years, 46 years of settlement building, of building walls, of building fences, of, of, of confining people, of creating huge profitable companies that live off the occupation, of creating large bureaucracies that live off counting the Palestinians, preventing them from moving, giving them IDs. The Israelis control every birth and death in the occupied territories. It has to be registered with the Israelis or it's not valid. Every exportation, every importation, they control. The monetary system, they control. There's a lot of interests related to that system of control, that matrix of control. You could, un you could, un you could unravel that. But in effect, what you have today is a one-state solution. It's just a very unattractive, very unequal, very unjust, very discriminatory, Jim Crow, apartheid, call it what you want, one state, where one set of people has all the rights, another set of people have some rights, and a very large number of people have virtually no rights.